Imagine if we could create code as we think and with our gestures. Imagine if technology was as poetic as it's radical. The world is here and it's captured in the interactive documentary called Clouds, showing us new dimensions of cinema, merging technology with user engagement, creating a real-time experience that is as spontaneous and as spectacular as life itself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on stage, Mr. Jonathan Minard. So thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, so before talking about the future, um, I want to revisit some ancient history. Uh, I work with code and data on a regular basis, um, the tools of computation for telling stories, um, though recently have been thinking a lot about this word, cinema, um, because I, I call myself a filmmaker, and um, the term still feels incredibly relevant. Um, so I was thinking about this term and what it means. Um, cinema moves us. It transports our senses through time and space. Um, I think about the early inventors of film, um, and it's kind of an incredible notion that uh, cinema emerged uh, just over 100 years ago. It was born out of labs developed by scientists and engineers who were trying to, uh, in, in a sense, replicate reality or maybe create a new reality, but in approaching that um, impossible goal, um, came up against constraints and then had to develop uh, a language. Um, I, when I think about cinema, I think about simulation. Um, you know, it's, it's a very anthropocentric medium. We're presented with um, simultaneous image and sound, which is particularly designed for our perceptual apparatus, and something about 24 frames a second uh, starts to cohere um, into a kind of temporal continuum, and we experience it as a kind of reality. And then, you know, through that, the magic of that image, um, we're transported um, and buy into that. And suddenly, we are encountering something which um, feels even more vivid um, than life itself somehow. Um, yet, uh, I would argue that that um, the innovators in film. Um, technologists are always striving for something more, a kind of greater level of immersion. So looking back, um, I love this, this example, and it's become kind of a, a myth in a way um, in cinematic history. Um, we had the, the Lumiers um, filming an oncoming train, and uh, they presented this to an audience, and the audience had never seen something like this before, and uh, according to the legend, um, uh, people braced themselves in terror and ran out of the room um, because they were so totally convinced of the reality of this this image um, you know, kind of throttling toward them. And then also the idea of the locomotive, the train as a symbol of speed and power and progress kind of moving into the future. Um, and so I, I love that example because in a sense it, it shows us that there's this sort of future shock that when we're introduced with a, a, a new kind of image we have to kind of... Um, uh, uh, reconcile it with, with our reality and learn to see. Um, and then I think about like the first 3D movie, um, which was shown um, incidentally at a, at, a, at a screening called Movies of the Future in 1922. Um, it's a silent film called The Man from Mars, and this was the first example of stereopsis. You know, what, what the audience must have been thinking when they saw a 3D movie for the first time, and yet for some, somehow it's still new to us. And then there's this other shot. It's, it's the reverse of that oncoming train. Um, we don't know who discovered it, but it became very popular. Um, this is probably from around 1896 um, from an Edison reel. So somebody decided to put a camera on the front of a train. Um, and so suddenly, you're not observing. You are the observer. You, you are the train um, moving through space, moving through time. Um, and it's an incredibly abstract, strange image and kind of you watch it and you're, you're transported. Um, and so I see this and I think about, I think about virtual reality. Um, this shot is called the Phantom Ride, as it's known, and so it's, it's used in a lot of films. This is like the introduction, the, the intro sequence in Tarkovsky's Solaris. And it's just, 
a shot from a car riding through tunnels. And then he starts to kind of mix in these strange science fiction sounds, and it kind of um, anticipates this interstellar journey. Or we see the same shot in um, 2001. And so this is depicting the astronauts uh, kind of um, uh, metaphysical journey through the Stargate, uh, consciousness accelerating um, through cosmic evolution. 2001 was screened in um, a cinema like this. Uh, it's called a Cinerama, and um, it's an ultra-wide screen. Um, I think the aspect ratio is 2.21, and uh, it required three projectors. So the original film would have been shot on 70 millimeter, which is about twice um, the resolution that we normally see in, in digital, that would be probably like 10K almost. So it's these incredibly vivid, hyper-real images. Um, and just imagine what it must have been like to see, see that for the first time. Um, it's about the equivalent of Omnimax. So these films um, were kind of all about spectacle. It's, it's, I think the focus isn't so much on narrative, but the kind of monumental image, and often they would deliver a kind of spectacular thrill ride. So you'd have a roller coaster or something, or it's, like, it's almost like an amusement park ride. Um, and uh, there was an inventor and, and filmmaker named Morton Helig who saw these and was inspired to take it a step further. He wanted to kind of break um, cinema beyond the frame, to dissolve the rectangle. And so he, he started to develop um, these strange inventions um, and one of the first is called the Sensorama. Um, and this is uh, Morton himself um, seated inside this apparatus. And it, it's, it kind of looks like an arcade racing game. And so um, there's a, a kind of binocular um, viewport inside. So you're seeing a 3D image and then um, feeling vibrations, hearing sound, feeling wind on your face. And one of the first actual demos was a motorcycle ride through, through Brooklyn. So he was um, really kind of pushing cinema into, into a new dimension by combining all the senses. So it's all about this kind of f extreme first-person perspective. And when I, when I see the sensorama, I think about um, films like The Di Diving Bell and the Butterfly or um, uh, Enter the Void, which also take this kind of radical first-person perspective where you're not observing, but you are the character in, in the film. Um, and so these all feel like, uh, you know, precursors to where we are now. So, um, by the way, Helig uh, patented this stereoscopic television apparatus, um, and this is essentially the head-mounted display. This is like the patent for the Oculus Rift. So this was invented in 1960. Um, and then it didn't really emerge kind of commercially until the 90s. So some of you may have experienced virtual reality in the 90s. Um, and it looked like this. Linked by a computer that tracks our individual motions, Waldron and I are now both inside the same electronic world. So here we are today. Oh God, this is awesome. Oh, that's amazing. modern day demos with the Oculus Rift, I think about early cinema. I mean, you're seeing roller coaster rides, flying games, um, these weird exploratory adventures. Um, they don't have to have a narrative. It's, it's all about just the pleasure of moving through simulated environments. Um, and it also, it reminds me of, um, you know, uh, discovering 3D graphics. Um, when I was in middle school um, playing games like Myst. Did many of you play Myst? <laughs> what, what, what's cool about Myst is that um, so it was a CD ROM game, and you're transported to this archipelago um, through a book, and 
classic. You're traveling through these these different ages. They're called. Um, uh, you know, they're through portals and kind of hidden passageways and uh, picking up clues and finding these like fragments of tattered text and like trying to piece the, the narrative together. And, and it doesn't actually ever come together, but there's this kind of sense of a, a world which has a history. It's weird. It's, 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 um, it's virtual at the same time that it feels old. It has like a patina. And I, I love that. Um, it really presented us with a new way of storytelling, which was that it doesn't have to be this kind of heavy-handed narrative, but you can um, let the user guide the experience and kind of make discoveries. Um, at the same time that Mist came out, there was a, a program called uh, Bryce 3D. Um, my dad was a graphic designer, uh, and so he would you know, buy software like this, and so I, I was playing around with Bryce in high school. Um, and it was really amazing, and basically it was a toolkit with a bunch of algorithms like Perl and Noise, um, you know, uh, terrain generators. So you could build virtual worlds and then fly around them, you know, using virtual cameras. And it turns out that um, there was a, a guy named James George who was about my age, living in Idaho, um, doing the same thing. Uh, we ended up meeting 10 years later um, and kind of geeking out over this, that we kind of had a similar background. But I, I think I'm, I'm sure a lot of people of my generation were exposed to 3D graphics through, through things like Bryce and these first-person computer games. Um, so Clouds is a project um, that I created. Uh, again, I mentioned my collaborator is James George. Um, we met at a, a hackathon in Pittsburgh. Um, he has a background in computer science and film, and I have a kind of similar background. And um, around this time, we were playing around with uh, the Microsoft Connect uh, which is a video game controller um, that, uh, f you know, for gestural control, basically recognizes your gestures. But it turns out that the Kinect is actually, um, can be used as a 3D scanner because it has an infrared um, camera um, that senses depth. And so we started playing around with this, developed a 3D scanner, and at that conference conducted a series of interviews with fellow artists from this community who work with code. Um, and it turned out to be a really compelling way of presenting them and their stories. Um, and so it, slow, it developed over time and turned into a documentary. And then eventually, when we needed to kind of put it all together, we realized that we couldn't present it as a linear documentary or a film, but rather because we were exploring these questions about the future of media and what it means to create with code, um, that, that we should make this an interactive film and develop it using those same tools. And so we ended up collaborating with the artists <laughs> We had interviewed about 50 of them, um, and they contributed their code to this world that we built. Um, so I'm going to show you a little preview of, of clouds. Any sound? So this is like the silent version of the film. Um. The total fantasy is that you could read the book and you learn these basic building blocks and you understand about rules and you program this and you program that and as you're iterating and building and building and building, ultimately you would have just essentially programmed the entire universe. So just to kind of explain what you're seeing, so these are, these are some of the artists, and um, it's a real-time experience. So um, as you're traveling through the world and encountering um, conversations with these artists, uh, you are in control of the camera. So you're able to move the perspective of the camera around the subjects. And then um, you're seeing these visualizations, and these are all interactive. And so this would be like an example of an artist's work who um, is describing how you can you know, paint um, with code or create these gestures. And so as they're talking about the work, you're interacting with their work. Um, but you're, at, you're interacting with the actual work. The algorithm is running in real time because everything is generated from code. Um, we navigate through the documentary by asking questions. Um, and so when you select one of those questions, that transports you to a particular node um, in the documentary. Um, 
And here you're seeing it, it's a multi-platform experience, so there's a version um, that runs on the Oculus Rift. So we had a chance to um, bring this, this software um, into a new platform kind of as it was being developed. Um, so in fact, Clouds is one of the first interactive documentaries made for this new generation of um, head-mounted displays. Um, just want to talk a little bit about kind of the architecture behind the film. So as I mentioned, um, it, it, the, the story is, is not a linear narrative or edited together. It, it, it rather exists as a, as a kind of network or a cloud. Um, and so we conducted all these interviews, and it was a, a vast, sprawling conversation. And then um, went through those conversations and meticulously uh, tagged clips of people speaking and talking about their work with keywords. And so the conversation um, is almost like a, a, a TED conference in virtual space. So um, people are talking about uh, code as a language and the future of virtual reality and data visualization uh, and you know uh, failure and creativity and all these ideas. Um, and so then, you know, when you ask a question, you're transported to a place on the, on the map, and then you can just watch, watch through. Um, and if you, if you don't select a new question, there's a system called a story engine, which is trying to connect the current clip to another relevant, you know, bit of information. Um, and so you can just meander through this graph, or you can, you know, navigate yourself. But essentially, it's, it's an infinite documentary. It, it, it is never the same. And every time you experience it, you're kind of ex experiencing a different chunk of this uh, vast web. So our interest was in creating a, a documentary experience which felt like the way that we encounter information on the web. You know, it's, it's not about being you know, presented with something in a didactic way, but rather you um, activating the content, you uh, pursuing your curiosity, you um, navigating through uh, this, this seemingly boundless space of information. Uh, so one of the really interesting innovations that's going on right now is uh, computational photography. And my collaborators and I were, were I think, instrumental in a kind of a primitive form of this. Um, and it's being taken pretty far. And so we're seeing uh, things like this, which is a, a, a scan of a human using what's called photogrammetry. Um, you can use 3D scanners, or you can use just a regular camera and take lots and lots of photos of a subject and end up with um, a, a nearly perfect geometric representation. Um, and so right now, um, these are being used um, in kind of a, a new kind of hybrid of video games and and cinema, and so this is from um, a game called Beyond by Quantic Dream, and so they, they work with actors who play characters, and so you have like Willem Dafoe and Ellen Page, and they're in um, a motion capture studio and acting out scenes. But then th those um, scenes are being um, represented through their avatars. But then you get to play through the the cinema, the film, or the video game, or whatever you call it, um, and you get to take on the role of one of those characters, or you can switch perspectives. Like, you can be um, Jody, or you can be her ghost, Aiden. And so you're able to, like, switch perspectives through, you know, this um, sequence, and you almost become, like, the cinematographer. You know, there's... And that's really interesting to think about, that, that we're, we're reaching a point where the, you know... Um, the decisions made by, that would traditionally be made by the director um, and, and uh, DP or cinematographer for a film are being transferred over to the user. So like, you know, you control the camera. Um, you become the, the character in the film. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these ideas, of course, have been predicted by, um, by science fiction authors. So um, William Gibson, who, uh, coined the term cyberspace in Neuromancer, um, talks about this idea of SimStim. So um, in, in Neuromancer, uh, there are two characters named Case and Molly. Um, and at one point, 
Molly becomes like the real world human avatar for Case. And so, so his, um, sorry, her like body and sensorium and, uh, and all of her like, uh, ex her experience of the world is plugged into his cortex. Um, so he is able to um, kind of passively ride through her consciousness. Um, now, when you say that I can be somebody else, what do you mean exactly? Well, we mean exactly that. We can put you inside someone else's body for 15 minutes. Can I be anybody that I want to be? <laughs> um, I really like that scene. That's from Being John Malkovich. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think cinema has been playing around this idea for a while, that that's kind of the dream, right? That, you know, if you really want true, like, ecstasy to be transported, um, why not just become someone else? To, to, what would it be like to experience through somebody else's body? Um, one of the first demos conducted with the Oculus Rift was this uh, gender swap um, by Be Another Lab. Um, and what they did was they put two people in a room together. They both have um, uh, head-mounted displays. The head-mounted displays have cameras mounted on them. The camera feed from one person is fed into the display of the other, so their, their s sort of signals are swapped. And so when one person's looking down, expecting to see their own body, they see the body of the other, um, who happens to be of a, you know, a different gender. Um, and then they have the people kind of coordinate motion, so they're able to sort of consensually um, touch themselves and, and sort of uh, have this almost mirroring effect. Um, it's really weird and wonderful. So I, I would call this ontological simulation. And if there is a future of cinema, I think that it's a problem to talk about the future of cinema because it's an evolving future. But um, somewhere it seems to be going is toward that total simulation. Um, but I like to think that um, while you could choose to experience what it's like to be another human, maybe we could try to you know, experience other forms of consciousness or uh, just other kinds of experience. And so maybe you know, in an ontological simulation, you could see what it's like to be a flower. And this is an actual Oculus Rift game called Flower. <laughs> um. So that's all, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I need to ask you a question. Sure. So if we take this to an extent where we actually can experience news from the eyes of the people being in those areas. So imagine the, the Tahrir Square 80 days in Egypt. Would we have been able to put on our Oculus, or what do you call it? Oculus, right. Oculus yes, and, and go into the news by being present through someone else's body? Yeah, I, I think that one of the, um, the, the powerful uh, effects of cinema has always been to create empathy, right? That, that's the, the, the end goal. And um, powerful storytelling can do that. I think great journalism can do that. Um, certainly with the aid of uh, a kind of simulation, um, you could have a more visceral experience. And, and, and so I think when, when the, you know, when Google Glass came out and the, the, the sort of popularity of, um, you know, uh, HD cameras in our smartphones have kind of offered that to a certain extent. I mean, we're able to kind of tap into information streams from around the world. And so that has, you know, revolutionized our ability to connect with um, people in remote places who have, are having very different experiences and to kind of empathize. Um, but certainly, yeah, I think that would be a wonderful thing to um, experience. Probably terrifying, too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think then you get into uh, problematic ethics, like, mm. um, you know, uh, you know, should people be allowed to, to enter a war zone? <laughs> and then what about privacy? Like, um, are, are, are people then offering up their kind of brain feeds to the world, or, or how do we negotiate that? So it, it's, it's a real interesting question, because um, I think that there are experiences that maybe we can't handle. And uh, I don't, yeah. 
I like yeah. the fact if technology <laughs> can help us become more empathetic, that would be wonderful. Definitely. Thank you, Thank much, you so, much. so much, Jonathan. It was an amazing experience. Thank you.